welcome Valley View. Let's stand, let's worship, let's lift up the one who is worthy of our praise, the one who has written our name down in glory, the one who loves us so much that he gave his life on the cross. Let's sing again. I was lost in shame, could not get past my pain, till he called my name. I'm so glad he changed me, darkness held me down. Pull me out I'm no longer
saved by grace. Put your hands together. Give him praise. Thank you, God. Lord Jesus, we love you so much. So grateful for the privilege of being in your house. You are great. You're awesome. You're worthy of all of our praise. We're thankful for the power of the Spirit of God that enables us and empowers us. The Word of God says that those that truly worship God must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So according to the truth of your Word, we lift up our voice, we open your Word now and ask that you speak truth to us. God, that you would just hide me behind the cross, that we would learn tonight the truth that you have in store for us. We love you, we exalt you, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here. appreciate it so much. Those that are watching um, online, let me just say real quick that as of Sunday, if you're watching this Sunday morning at 1030, we have children's ministry kicking off. So turn it off and come on down. We'd love to have you. But I'm glad all of you are here in person. Uh, Starting right now, I don't know where, if you've been keeping up with your Uh, Foundations New Testament reading. I know I mentioned it every week. I believe it's really critically important, and I invite you to do that. But let's just say you've fallen behind and haven't been diligent in that. Right now is a great time to start because we are kicking off right now in the book of John. Over the next four weeks, four and a half weeks, uh, we'll be in the book of John. Uh, We finished this week in week 37, 2 Peter chapter 3, and John chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4. When I came to John chapter 4, I just knew that we had to use this passage because I am convinced that this passage really is relevant to where we are in our culture right now. It it answers a lot of questions for us. I entitled this message, The Lord of the Harvest. But here's the questions that I want to ask that I believe that John chapter 4 answers for us. How should you respond to people that you don't agree with? And answer that without using the word Facebook, please. Number two, how how do you treat people that are different than us? How do you treat people that maybe you don't see eye to eye with? uh, They're different. Uh, how, How can you act godly towards people in a world that is ungodly? And how can you overcome the prejudices in your life? And don't sit there and tell me you don't have any. I'm going to ask you again, how do you overcome the prejudices in your life? I love 
this story in John chapter 4. The answer to all of those questions is found here in the story of the woman at the well. She was a Samaritan woman that Jesus met at the well in a little town called Sychar in the region of Samaria. John chapter 4, verse 3 and 4 says that Jesus, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. You might recall that in it was in Galilee where Jesus performed his first miracle when he turned the water into wine at the marriage feast. And then it says in verse 4 of John chapter 4, he needed to go through Samaria. Now let me explain something to you real quick. This is all preliminary, okay? There was basically from Judea to Galilee three different routes that you could take. Now take your hand out in front of you right here about at your stomach level. Do it. This is Judea. You got it? That's Judea. Right here at your chin, that is Samaria. And right up here at the top of your head, that is Galilee. Okay? They were in Judea, and they were going to Galilee, and here's Samaria right in the middle. There were basically three routes, though, that the Jews would take to get to Galilee from Judea. They would go west out to the Mediterranean Sea, Sometimes they would catch a boat and go up the coastline. Sometimes they would just travel up to Joppa and then up to Caesarea, around Samaria, up to Galilee. Or they could take another route to the east. They would go over to the region of Perea, uh, and they would go over there to the Jericho Road, a very treacherous, the most treacherous road of its day. It was riddled with crime, muggings, and all of that, but they would go over there and they would go up the Jordan River and all the way around and up around Samaria. And then the third route was they could go straight through Samaria. The Jews always would take either one or two. They would never take number three because they hated the Samaritans. And I don't use that word lightly. They didn't think down on them. They hated them. It was a known fact, and they hated them for a lot of different reasons. Uh, but the Jews hated the Samaritans so badly uh, that they were willing to take the long way around, even take a boat, or take the most treacherous route known to man at the time, instead of going straight through Samaria, because they hated the Samaritans so bad. Well, why did they hate them so bad? Well, why was it a common Jewish prayer? that they would say, Lord, do not remember the Samaritans in the resurrection. <laughs> they hated them. Does that sound like that might fit into the narrative of 2020 in our culture? And, and here's what's more. There were three reasons why they hated the Samaritans. They hated them for racial reasons. They hated them for political reasons. And they hated them for religious reasons. Sound familiar? They hated them for racial reasons. The Jews from the, when Israel was split into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, the two became different altogether. The southern kingdom remained steadfast Jews, and they worshiped in Jerusalem. But those in the northern kingdom, they intermarried with the Assyrians who had occupied the northern kingdom. And it was named by King Omri after uh, King Solomon's rule. King Omri named that northern kingdom, at least a part of it, Samaria. And over time, that whole northern part of Israel became known as Samaria. And, and so because of these racial reasons, because the northern kingdom, those Samaritans intermarried with the Assyrians, and they were known as, to the Jews, half breeds they had polluted the race. So there was racial tension. And then there was religious or political reasons. When the nation of Israel split, the, the northern kingdom under King Omri, they were taken captive by Assyria, as I said, and they did not rule as the southern kingdom. Politically, it was a whole different set of rules and guidelines. And so politically, they were polar opposite. And then there was the religious. The, the Samaritans quit worshiping in Jerusalem, and they established Mount Gerizim as their place of worship. They no longer considered the worship of Yahweh, 
In fact, they didn't even count for all of the Old Testament, none of the prophets. All that they held true as God's word was the Pentateuch, the law itself. And so for religious reasons, the Jews despised the Samaritans. So when they had a chance to go from Judea to Galilee, they were not going through Samaria. They would go that way or they would go that way, but they were not going to go that way, even though it was absolutely the quickest and the shortest route. That's how bad they hated the Samaritans. You got the picture? So Jesus comes and he says, I need to go through Samaria. What he was saying is, I have a divine appointment with someone that you all are supposed to hate and you're prejudiced against. But I'm going to show you how a Christian should respond to those that are not like you. Now, I've read a lot about this passage. And there are those uh, commentators that say that Jesus took this route through Samaria because he was prioritizing the kingdom work And it was shorter, it was faster, it was less steps. And I'm going to show you in a few minutes why that's absolutely not true. What I just said is true. He had a divine appointment with a woman that he would meet at Jacob's well in the little town of Sychar. So what I did as I read this story for the umpteenth dozen times, I preached from it many times. But I wanted God to speak to me fresh about where we are. Make it relative to right now. And so so God, I believe, gave me four statements that I want to make to you about this passage of Scripture and how you can live a Christian life in a world gone mad. How you can be a Christian to those that are not Christian in return. How you can be Christian to those that you're supposed to hate and despise culturally. How you're supposed to respond in that way very relative message, I believe. And Jesus is where we take our cues. Listen, I don't have to take my cues from Black Lives Matter or any other social organization or some political organization. For 2,000 years, we've been taking our cues as born-again believers from the Word of God. That don't mean we've always gotten it right. But what I'm saying to you is we need to take the word of God and apply the truth of God's word as to how we're to respond to people that aren't like us. It's very clear and it's very obvious. And let me give you four truths that God spoke to my heart. First of all, we must reach out to the lost and hurting. That's why we were created, church. We've got to reach out to those that are lost and hurting, and I would even add outcast. Those that are looked down on, those that are portrayed as hopeless and helpless, God has called us to reach out to them. Look at verses 5 through 10. Got a lot of scripture tonight, so read along, okay? So Jesus came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, after all, he was fully God and fully man. He was wearied from his journey. He sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. You think that's not an important passage? I'm going to tell you why it is. The disciples had left to go into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it, uh, and who, and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Now, this was not just a Samaritan. This is a Samaritan woman in a public watering hole about a half a mile out of the main city of Sychar was the uh, Jacob's well. It's still there to this day, and uh, all archaeologists agree this is the well. It's about a half a mile from town. And so the disciples leave. They go into town. Jesus is sitting there, and he asks this woman for something to drink, and then he offers her the gift of salvation. It was culturally unacceptable for a Jewish man in a public place to speak to any woman let alone a Samaritan woman. Jesus broke through every cultural boundary known to man. And yet Jesus not only spoke to her, not only was kind to her, he offered her eternal life. 
He said there in verse 10, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now, let's just take a time out real quick before we move on to the other three statements. I, I want to talk about this woman a little bit that Jesus poured into. No pun intended. He poured into her because he saw in her the need of her heart. He wasn't looking at the fact she was a Samaritan or that she was a woman. He was looking at her because she, he knew that she needed what he had. She needed the living water. And, and so he offered her salvation. But this woman was confused. And to say that she's confused is a gross understatement. She was confused about everything you could be confused about. Have you ever met anybody like that? Well, I have. Some of you are here. No, I'm kidding. I kid. She was confused about her place in society. She didn't fit in. The, the Samaritans were already outcasts. She was an outcast among the outcast. <laughs> That's about as low as you can go. Verse 6 says that it was about the sixth hour. Now, the, the sundial was uh, discovered about two, three hundred years before Christ. And, and so once the sundial was discovered, the Rome, Romans, uh, under Roman rule, they measured time during daylight, basically for 12 hours of daylight. So the time would start counting from sunrise. So the sixth hour was about noontime. Okay? This woman, the normal custom was for the women of this region... We're talking modern-day Iraq, very hot. And the normal custom was for the women to go collect water early in the morning or late in the evening to avoid the intense heat. Here's this woman all by herself in the hottest time of the day with not a friend in sight, save the Savior of the universe at the well to draw water. Because of her reputation, she was shamed and shunned by her own people, but not Jesus. She was confused about her place in society. She was confused about Jesus' offer. She was looking at it as the physical, and Jesus, as always, was more concerned about the spiritual. The woman said to him in verse 11, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. If you skip over a couple of chapters to John chapter 6 verse 35, Jesus would there say, I'm the bread of life. He who believes in me will never hunger. And he who believes in me will never thirst. He was the living water. He was talking about himself. This woman was focused on the physical like Nicodemus in John chapter 3 in the preceding chapter. Remember Nicodemus came to Jesus by night? And he says, oh, good master, wh wh what do we have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, marvel not that I say unto you, you've got to be born again. Jesus was talking spiritual. Nicodemus took him literal. Well, how can I, again, go into my mother's womb? Well, you moron. He ain't talking about literally being born again. He's talking about spiritually, you've got to be born again. Jesus was always more concerned with the spiritual than the physical. But this woman was confused. You see, this is why prejudice is a sin. When we are prejudiced against someone, we're focused on the outside rather than the inside need of that person's heart. And Jesus is showing us an example about somebody that's confused. She, she don't know where she belongs in society. She don't understand his offer because she has been trained by those that were prejudiced against her to be judged by the outside, by the physical, rather than the spiritual. She was confused. She's also confused, if you didn't know, about marriage and relationships. In verse 15, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. She still don't get it, does she? And I love what Jesus does here. This is, if you ever want to witness to somebody, you need to listen to what I'm getting ready to tell you. Jesus goes straight to the problem because you realize 
Nobody can get saved until they understand their sin. So what does Jesus do here? Look what he does. He looks at her and he says, Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I think sheepishly said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you've said that right. I know you don't have a husband, but you've had five. And the man that you're now living with is not your husband. Yikes. Now, let's back up to the very beginning of this message. Yes, she was a Samaritan, and she was a woman. and She was as lost as lost could be. She was an outcast. She was an adulterer. She was a five-time divorcee. She was the Elizabeth Taylor of her day, except she wasn't rich and famous. Jesus realized the woman was confused about the offer of salvation, so he cut to the core. He confronted her with the sin in her life. You see, Jesus knew that this, this woman was lost. She was a woman of ill repute. And yet, he offers her eternal life. She was confused. She is confused about her place in society. She was confused about Jesus' offer. She was confused about marriage and relationships in general. Apparently, she didn't have a whole lot of friends. She's out there high noon right by herself to avoid people. But she's also confused about worship and religion. I've had this happen many, many times. The Spirit is moving. You're witnessing to someone. They're confronted with the sin in their life. And you know what they'll do? They'll change the subject. Look what she does. Look at this. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on the mountain. What's that got to do with anything? Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. Talking about Mount Gerizim. And you Jews say that Jerusalem is the place where you want ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither worship on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Worship the Father. You, you worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. Again, talking about himself. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Again, as often is the case, when somebody's confronted with salvation and face to face with the sin in their life, they just want to change the subject. Jesus knew there was no need to talk about worship with her because she didn't even know who God was. She was sitting talking to the very face of God and she didn't even know it. And Jesus said, there's coming a time where he's being prophetic. There's coming a time where you won't worship on this mountain and you won't worship in Jerusalem. And he was right in 70 AD, Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed. And once Assyrian rule stopped in the northern kingdom, they no longer worshipped at Mount Gerizim either. So Jesus was prophetic and he was absolutely accurate. Both of those places became obsolete. But I want you to look again for our benefit at verse 23 and 24 because this is for us, Valley View. This is for you. This is for me. The hour is coming, the word says, and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. Listen. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Now, I've heard it many times. A lot of people talk about, that's talking about worshiping in the spirit. That's not what it's talking about. It's not talking about the Holy Spirit. He's talking about your spirit. He's talking about your heart. He's talking about your attitude. He's talking about that which is in you that yearns and longs for communion with the Father who sent his Son to die on the cross for you. You've got to worship the Father with the right heart in a right spirit, and in truth. So what should govern our worship? A right heart, a right spirit, and the truth. The, the Spirit of God will never lead you where the Word of God forbids you to go. I love that quote. I've used it many times. And it's, that's why I'm not scared of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit's never going to lead you to go where the Word of God forbids you to go. In other words, the Spirit of God's not going to lead you to do something crazy. The, Word of, the Spirit of God's going to lead you 
to live out the truth of God's word, especially when it comes to worship of Almighty God. She was confused. Boy, you get the picture? <laughs> this chick was confused. She was confused about everything you can be confused about, including, most importantly, who Jesus was. She was confused about her place in society, about Jesus' offer, about her marriage and relationships. She was confused about worship and religion. But most of all, she was confused about this man sitting in front of her, offering her eternal life. Just went right over her head. Verse 25 and 26, the woman said to him, I know, this is good, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. The Samaritans believed that there would come a Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, you're looking at him. I who speak to you, and he. Now, that bothers some people that Jesus said that, which is why I didn't go around saying it much. You know, when Jesus was hanging around with Jews, he seldom ever referred to his Messiahship. He knew he was the Messiah. He knew he was God's son, but he would seldom ever say it. You know why? Because the Jews had pigeonholed that the Messiah would be political or military in nature. And that wasn't why Jesus came at all. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus came to win people like this woman that was desperate and in need of a Savior. He came to die for you and for me. And so he came uh, to win the world. Th this was a light bulb coming on moment for this woman. You, wanna, you want me to tell you how I know this woman realized Jesus was the Messiah and received her into her heart, received him into her heart? You, know, you want to know how I know that? Because it never says in here this woman received Christ, but it's implicitly implied because she came to Jacob's well looking for something physical what'd she come to the well for water and what'd she bring to put it in a water pot that water pot is a metaphor that means it represents something else that water pot represents everything in this world Everything in this world. It, it, it represents everything that's keeping you from being everything God wants you to be that is of a worldly nature. That water pot w was everything to her because she went there to get water, her provisions for the rest of the day. But look what happens in John 4, 27 and 28. And at that, this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman, yet no one said, what, what are you looking, what do you seek or... What are you, why are you talking to her? They, none of them said that. The woman then left her water pot. Hmm. Went her way into the city. She came for water, right? That's why she came in the middle of the day. It's hot. She has this conversation, and that which represented everything that the world had to offer now meant nothing to her. She just left it there. She left it all behind because she had met the king of the universe, and she realized this is he just told her, <laughs> you're talking to the Messiah. Woo! Man, it gives me chills a little bit, because that's just really good. Have you met him yet? Do you know him? The first thing I get from this text is that we're called to reach out to the lost and the hurting and the confused and those that have no way out. They're outcasts. That's who Jesus has called us to. Statement number two, and they're not all this long. Statement number two, we've got to learn the lesson of the harvest. Valley View, listen to me. I know you know it, but we need to start practicing this truth. Not when the coronavirus is over, not when we have a revival. Right now, tonight, we need to decide, hey, this is why we exist. This is the reason God has called us. This is the reason we're a church. He says in verse 35 and 36, let, let me just give you the law of the harvest. The law of the harvest is the fields are white unto harvest. That's the law. Listen to what he says. Do you not say, he's talking to his disciples. The disciples started telling him, hey, man, hey you need to get something to eat, Jesus. You, you need some provisions. You've been walking, you're tired. Have you eaten anything? And he said, hey, I've got meat to eat that you don't know anything about. My meat is to do the will of the one that sent me. In other words, what's more important to me is that woman that y'all saw just walk away. That's the reason I came. 
That means more to me than any physical sustenance that I'm going to take. That will sustain me till the day I die on the cross for the sins of the world. That's the reason I came. That's what he was saying. They didn't get it either, but that's what he was saying. And so he says to them, do you not say that there's still four months and then comes the harvest? That's the way church is these days. Oh, we're going to get to it. We're going to get to it. We're, we're, we're going we're, we're to, boy, we're going to have a revival, man. We're going to invite. We, we, we're going to say who's our one. We're going to name that one. When, when that revival comes, then we're going to focus on the harvest. I suggest to you that that's the only reason that we're a church is to reach lost people like this woman for Jesus Christ. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. You want to have a revival? Don't wait for a revival to invite people to Jesus. Invite people to Jesus and you'll see revival. That is revival because those that sowed and those that reaped and those that are saved come together rejoicing in Jesus Christ. Listen, we spend way too much of our time in the church worrying about who's mad and who's glad, who's in and who's out and who's happy and who's sad. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, people all around us are dying and going to hell. I want you to listen to me, church. It's time to wake up and follow the example of Jesus and start sharing the living water with those that are tired of bringing their water pots to the well only to be empty the next day all over again. That describes our world. They're buying into this and they buy into that and they're empty on the inside. Only the living water can quench that thirst. Jesus is merciful. Jesus can save. Get your eyes on Jesus and start sharing him with everyone you can before it's eternally too late. Listen to me. This pandemic ought to set our hearts on fire more than ever to be a church alive and on fire for Jesus because we ought to realize that this world, Jesus really is coming back again. We don't have forever to get right. We don't have forever to start telling people about Jesus. Listen, I'm sorry if you're afraid. I'm sorry if you quit church because you don't want to wear a mask. I'm sorry if you've forsaken the assembling of ourselves, but are perfectly okay with the beach trip and the lake trip and the boat trip and every other trip. Oh, that's all good. But coming to church somehow is a dangerous thing. Listen to me. I don't know. I'm sorry for all of that. But what I do know that it's time to reap the harvest of lost souls for the glory of God. It's time, it's high time, it's past time. Maybe that's the reason for the church that the coronavirus has come. To get us to reset, to recalibrate why we're here in the first place. We've got to learn the lesson of the harvest. We've got to reach out to the lost and the hurting and the confused. Statement number three. We've got to realize, uh, I feel like God gave me this. And this is so simple. But don't just sit there and tell me you're a Christian. Don't sit there and tell me you're a disciple of Jesus. I want you to listen to this statement, and I'm going to prove it with Scripture. A follower of Jesus will act like Jesus. What a novel idea. That sounds so basic and fundamental. But do you know how many people call themselves followers of Jesus that are nailing people to the wall because they're not like us? Let's just take an issue. Abortion. It's wrong, it's sinful. No doubt in my mind about it. It breaks the heart of God. But why would we get on social media and condemn people to hell because they may have had an abortion? In what way do you think that is going to reach them for the glory of Jesus Christ? Listen to me, there's two victims in every abortion. There's the unborn child and there's the mom who had that abortion. It's not, it's tragic and it's sad, but it doesn't mean they're unsalvageable. It doesn't mean that they're unsavable, but we make them that way because rather than sitting down at the well and giving them the the river of life, we condemn them and we judge them and we chew them up and we spit them out. That's just one example. There's many. A follower of Jesus acts like Jesus. Let me tell you who I'm talking about. Back up to verse 7 of chapter 4. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to do what? To buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink 
for me, a Samaritan woman, listen, this says it all. For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Now, let me ask you a question. Where did the disciples go? A half a mile away into the Samaritan village to do business with some Samaritans. All they were doing was modeling their life and their behavior after their master. And a little bit later on, after Jesus leads this woman to the Lord, she takes off running, man. She leaves, she's so excited, she left her water park. She, she left all the past behind her. And she left. She couldn't wait to tell everybody that she knew. Whether they liked her or not, she was getting ready to share with them. I just met the Messiah. Don't you think it's possible this is the Messiah? He told me everything about me. The disciples show up as soon as she leaves. And do you remember in verse 27 and 28? Nobody, no, one of the disciples says, hey, why are you talking to her? What, what does she need? Or why are you bothering the master? None of them said that. You want to know why? Because they were followers of Jesus. And they were just acting like Jesus. Church, that's what we need to be. When you're in doubt, when you question what your action needs to be, how about let it be that? Let your prayer tonight be, Lord, I'll go where you lead me. I'll share with those you put in my path. I'll love like you love. I'll do what you ask me to do. Lord, I just want to be like you. There's a fourth statement, and I'll be done. Just put this, if the shoe fits, wear it. Saved people will bear fruit for the kingdom of God. I was talking to Mary Jack about that, and she said, I hate that. I hate for you to say that. I said, why? She said, I can't do nothing. I said, huh, shut up. Bearing fruit's not the busy work that you do, even though that might be part of it for you. I see the fruit of her life, of her prayer life, of her encouragement to me. I see that fruit. But just let me restate that. Everybody that is a Christian, everybody that is a Christ follower will bear fruit. Was it not Jesus in John chapter 15 that said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He that's in me and I in them, the same will bear what? Much fruit. It's not hypothetical. It's not if, maybe, it's you will if you belong to him. If you're connected to Jesus, it's not what you do. It's what Jesus does through you that is the fruit. Well, in this particular text, we see a saved person bearing fruit. I love this. Verse 28 and 29, the woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. <laughs> I love that, man. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. Then you drop down 10 verses. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. That's why I know he didn't go through Samaria to save time. He stayed there for two days. He had a divine appointment with this woman at the well. And many more believed because of his word. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him. And we know that this indeed is the Christ, the Savior of the world. Whew. I mean, that's just really good, isn't it? You see, this woman, there's many that believe because she said, I just met a man. He, he's changed me. from the, They could tell the difference in her just like that. They knew her reputation. They knew what she had been through. But they could tell something was different. And they believed just because of her testimony. And then many others, when they came and met him, hey, we heard what you said, but not only do we hear what you said, but now we see for ourselves, this is the Christ, the Messiah, and he stayed with them for two days. Isn't it interesting that she says, he told me everything that I ever did. She's talking about her sin. Jesus knew everything about her. And his response to her was he loved her. He loved her. Man, we get the dirt on somebody and we want to bury them. Jesus loved her, even though he knew everything bad about her. So here we have this nameless woman. No name, just the woman at the well. For 2,000 years, she's the woman. There's songs written about her. 
Sermons preached about her, she has no name. You want to know why I believe she has no name? Because that woman of the well is you, and it's me. And because God loved us so much, he sent his only begotten son to die on the cross that we could drink the living water of Jesus Christ. Amen. God, I love you so much. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truth of it. And God, I know there's burdened hearts in this room, and I know there are confused people that will hear this message either online or even right here in this room. God, we're so grateful for a Savior of the world who loves us so much that even in spite of all of our flaws, our sin, and all of the bad junk that you know everything about, you love us anyway. Teach us to love like that. Teach us to get busy sharing the living water with those that are out there in the field, white unto harvest. Lord, the Bible says laborers are few. Let them rise up during this season that we would quit putting it off till tomorrow. And right now, right now, this day, we would simply say, God, I, I want to start afresh and anew. I want to glorify you with my life. I want to be the witness you've created me to be. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All of God's people said, Thank you so much for being here, headed to Connection Point, and uh, I would invite you uh, to come, come by there. If there's any decision in your heart, in your life, uh, if you need to pray, whatever decisions in your life, if I haven't met you, I would love to do that, um, and so come even now, okay? God bless, thanks for being here. You have a great rest of the week.